Tonight's seminar, Who Speaks for the Earth, Energy, Politics and Art, will be a pretty unique opportunity to see some amazing speakers from both Australia and overseas who have an intimate knowledge of the topic uh, at hand. So you're in for quite a treat. I'm not going to uh, introduce the, uh, the speakers themselves. I'll leave that to our chair in one moment. But I'd like just to take this opportunity to thank our co-hosts, RMIT Gallery and Melbourne Conversations, the City of Melbourne's program of free talks, and the Aegis Re Research Network at RMIT University. I'd also like to thank the wonderful sponsors and partners for Art Plus Climate Equals Change 2015, without whom this festival would not have come to fruition. Our principal partners, Mr. David Lease of the Billard Lease Partnership, and the Lord Mayor's Charitable Foundation, the Government of the United States, our principal knowledge partner, the University of Melbourne, our responsible banking partner, Bank MECU, and our government partner, Creative Victoria, and of course, all our many other valuable and supportive and uh, imaginative and brave supporters. I'd now like to introduce our chair for this evening's forum, Associate Professor Linda Williams from RMIT University. Linda leads the Aegis Research Network at RMIT. Her research focuses on how the arts and humanities are responding to climate change. In addition, Linda has curated exhibitions in this field such as Heat, Art and Climate Change, 2112, Imagining the Future, and Japanese art after Fukushima, Return of Godzilla, which is currently on show at RMIT Gallery as part of Art Plus Climate Equals Change 2015. So it gives me much pleasure to introduce to the uh, lectern, uh, Linda. Thank you very much. I might stay seated. Um, um, I'd like to also acknowledge um, the Wurundjeri people, as indeed RMIT always does, as the land on which we're holding uh, this event, and, and to respectfully recognise elders, both past and present. Guy has um, already um, thanked various sponsors, but I'd particularly like to uh, thank RMIT uh, Gallery for the support for this um, event tonight, which is linked to the art, uh, Japanese art after Fukushima um, Return of Godzilla show, which I welcome you all to go and uh, see. Um, I've been asked tonight to um, address the issue of Fukushima. So what I'll do is walk you through the whole thing, what's occurring now and what will occur in the future. Um, General Electric built six Mark I reactors near an earthquake fault um, on, the sh on the eastern shore of Japan. I knew the three GE engineers who designed those reactors and they resigned in 1975 saying that they were too dangerous and they shouldn't be built. Um, they testified before the Congress but it made no difference. So they o these, these reactors operated for many years uh, and then we had the earthquake and then we had the tsunami. The earthquake damaged the reactors uh, functionally, but then in came the tsunami and drowned the reactors. Now, the earthquake caused the external electricity supply to cease. Um, they need the external electricity supply to supply the pumps which pump up to a million gallons a minute of water to keep the reactors cool. If they lose the pumps and they lose the cooling water, the reactors melt down. However, beneath, in, in, in that situation, they have diesel generators, emergency diesel generators the size of a house, many of them, beneath the reactors. And they will operate for about, they've got fuel for about eight days. But then the tsunami came in and drowned the diesel generators. So there were no pumps. So desperate were they that they were running out to the car park to get car batteries to car try and keep the pumps going. So what happened was the water level fell and in each reactor there's about, I'm um, generalizing, 100 tons of fissioning uranium, which was our uranium, came from Australia. Uh, 
probably from Olympic Dam or Ranger. Um, and within three hours, three reactors, units one, two, and three, started to melt down. The intrinsic heat of E equals MC squared, well, it actually, yeah, they were still fissioning, and the intrinsic heat of the radioactive elements is so high that the block of 100 tonnes starts to melt into a molten radioactive lava. And it melted its way through six inches of steel of the reactor containment vessel onto the floor, a concrete floor called the containment. And we're not sure where that molten lava's gone, but some people think it's melted its way through the concrete into the earth. That's called, by the industry, the melt through to China syndrome. And if you uh, remember, there was a film called The China Syndrome with Jane Fonda and Jack Hawking? Jack, someone, I can't remember, Lemon. Anyway, they built the reactors, there was a cliff, but they cut the cliff away and they, they built the reactors at sea level. Had they kept them on top of the cliff and pumped the water up to cool the reactors, they probably wouldn't have been damaged by the tsunami. But they were sitting ducks for this. Reactor four had just been, um, all the fuel had been taken out and put into uh, a spent fuel pool um, about 40 feet, 100 feet above the uh, ground on the top of the reactor. And the only thing that protects the, fu the spent fuel pool is a sort of roof like a Kmart roof. Um, now, the reactors were built in front of a mountain range and water pours down from that mountain consistently and when the reactors were intact, the water went into the Pacific and didn't get polluted. However, now we've got three molten cores, um, either in a crack containment vessel that the water can get into or in the earth. And the water consistently pours down, uh, takes radioactive elements with it, obeys the radioactive cause, and the water itself becomes radioactive waste. Every day since that accident occurred, three to 400 tonnes of very radioactive water have poured into the Pacific every day since uh, 2011. Um, actually, the water is becoming more and more radioactive um, because I, I think the cores are sort of allowing more isotopes to to be dissolved into the water. Uh, they also are cooling the reactor cores, pouring water in, in case there's not another fission reaction. Although, I've got a friend who's a, um, a developmental uh, evolutionary biologist who is testing the birds and insects and animals in the exclusion zone of Fukushima and Chernobyl and finding a lot of mutations and 40% of the birds are sterile, the male birds, their brains are small, they've got tumours, and what happens to the birds will happen to us, of course. But he said he's been advised to take potassium iodide recently, which only has a, radioactive iodine has a half-life of eight days, that only lasts for six weeks, but that indicates there's probably fissioning going on now. Every day, huge amounts of radioactive elements are also pumped into the air from those reactors. Now, the problem is that no one can get near those radioactive cores or they would die. They would get a lethal dose, dose within two minutes. So they're sending robots in to try and find where they are, but then the robots don't work either. They don't melt, but their, their electricity wiring melts. So no one really knows what's going on. TEPCO, the Tokyo Electric Power Company, has made a profit this year, I think of $12 billion, um, because TEPCO and the, and the Japanese government are really one and the same thing, and they call it the nuclear village. Um, Japan wants to keep their nuclear industry going because, in fact, they make the reactor vessels and they make all sorts of other parts of nuclear reactors, which they're exporting to Turkey and other parts of the world. And the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in America is advising uh, the Japanese to open all their reactors because they've all been shut down since the accident. Um, and they've managed all right. I've been to Japan three times since that time. Um, they've just passed a secrecy law in Japan, Abe, who incidentally is going to rearm 
and we remember what the Japanese did during the Second World War. Um, have I got more time? Okay. <laughs> Uh, so that any journalist who writes about this honestly can be jailed for 10 years. Um, my colleagues, the physicians, um, have been told not to tell their patients that their symptoms may be related to radiation. Um, they are only testing for one cancer, which is thyroid cancer. All cancers can be induced by radiation. However, if you're exposed to radiation, it may take five or eight to 80 years for the cancer to develop. That's called the latent period of carcinogenesis, the incubation time for cancer, whereas for a cold, it's 48 hours. They have been testing children in the Fukushima prefecture under the age of 18, and they've found now, um, and this is a little old, this data, that 104 children have developed thyroid cancer. In that population, the normal incidence is one or two per million. Yet, the industry is saying it's not related to radiation. In Chernobyl, uh, there are thousands of cases of thyroid cancer, and they started appearing four years afterwards, although no one started examining them until four years. They say in Japan, well, the cancers occurred too soon, so there's a lot of lying and obfuscation. The International Atomic Energy Agency is working with the Fukushima Medical School to build a new hospital, a cancer hospital. So that tells you everything, really. Um, the food, do not eat ever again any Japanese food. No miso, no rice, no tea, no green tea. The tea uh, grown south of Tokyo is radioactive, with cesium in it. Uh, no fish, no sushi from Japan, uh, no seaweed. Be very careful, because a hell of a lot of radiation escaped in fact, three times more noble gases escape from Fukushima than from Chernobyl. There's been a study by the New York Academy of Sciences or a collection of papers from Russia to show now over a million people have died as a result of Chernobyl of very many diseases. And you can look up that, that uh, book on the New York Academy of Sciences that's called Chernobyl. But then you extrapolate that to Fukushima, where the Japanese population is very much more densely populated than around Chernobyl. Incidentally, Chernobyl is in the Ukraine. There are 15 reactors in the Ukraine, as big as Chernobyl. Now there's a war in, in the Ukraine between Russia and America. For the first time since the Cold War, they're confronting each other militarily. The Americans set up that coup. Poroshenko is an American puppet. Um, and each country now has its nuclear weapons on a higher state of alert, we are in a very dangerous situation. So if they have an ordinary conventional war, it's easy enough with a missile to melt a reactor down. No one talks about that. Now, the various isotopes that get out are interesting. First is radioactive iodine, which is absorbed through the lung when you breathe it in. Um, and what happened was that when the meltdown occurred, first the wind blew from west to east across the Pacific for three days. So the ambient levels of radiation of noble gases in Seattle went up 40,000 times above normal. But then the wind changed and blew over the population. And because the Japanese were measuring it, and the Americans were by flying planes, they knew where the radiation was going, but they didn't tell the public because they didn't want to create panic. So the public fled into the path of the highest radiation level. In Tokyo, where it rained and the, and the wind changed and blew the radiation down to Tokyo. There are parts of Tokyo, if you pick up the dirt from the ground or even the, the dust from vacuum cleaners in apartments, some of it's so radioactive, in America it would be designated for a radioactive waste dump. But because it takes so long for patients to develop leukemia and other cancers, um, that's, that's the ace up the sleeve of the nuclear industry. Okay, cesium that got out lasts for uh, 300 years. It's a potassium analog, and it goes to the brain, well, all parts of the body, but particularly it causes brain tumors, muscle tumors, rhabdomyosarcomas. Uh, it goes to the ovaries, um, strontium nucleotide, which got out. That's a calcium analog that goes to bone, um, and that causes bone cancer or leukemia. Uh, there's plutonium, which is the most toxic element known. One millionth of a gram causes cancer. 
Each reactor has about 250 kilos of plutonium in it. You only need five kilos to make a nuclear weapon. The half-life of plutonium-239 is 24,400 years. It lasts virtually forever, and therefore any country with a reactor can make a bomb, hence proliferation of nuclear weapons as they're selling nuclear power as the answer to global warming. We're in a very, very dangerous situation, and we will see a tremendous amount of disease in Japan as a result of Fukushima, and the Pacific Ocean is going to get more and more and more radioactive. Mind you, it's a big body of water, so it's diluted. But the solution to pollution by dilution is fallacious when it comes to radiation because the food chain uh, concentrates the elements by orders of magnitude in the algae, the crustaceans, the little fish, the big fish, and us. And they're finding now tuna off the coast of California containing isotopes from Fukushima, and we live on the Pacific Ocean, and fish swim thousands of miles, and you can't taste, smell, or see radiation in the food that you eat. Thank you. Thank you very much, Helen. <coughs> I'm, I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions around that. Um, I'd now like to ask um, Bill Fox to speak, and uh, our speakers are going to sit at the front so we can see some of the uh, images that Bill would like to show. Well, good evening. It's a pleasure to be here, as always, in Melbourne. Um, you have a great treasure sitting amongst you this evening. His name is Guy Abrahams. He is the CEO of Climart, uh, which is the nonprofit organization that's put on this extraordinarily uh, rich and globally recognized art and climate program. So, Guy, uh, I think all of us owe you a vote of thanks for that. Thank you so much. Thank you. I've been talking this week about art and the Anthropocene. The Anthropocene was proposed by the Nobel laureate Will Steffen, uh, a stratospheric uh, chemist who was one of the three people to discover the, the uh, mechanism for the depletion of ozone in the atmosphere. Uh, and he suggested that the Anthropocene, which means we're living in an epoch, a geological epoch that's defined by human activity, might be suggested to start in 1790 with the burning of fossil fuels uh, through the commercial steam engine that James Watt refined from earlier efforts. And um, that's one way to define, define the beginning of the Anthropocene. Other people said, no, the Anthropocene starts 10,000 years ago. Uh, when people are really starting to farm around the planet to a large level and changing uh, the climate regime. Other people have said, no, it's actually a nuclear phenomenon. It actually, the Anthropocene begins with the layer of radioactivity materi radioactive materials that we lay down around the planet, things that have been circulated in the atmosphere through above ground uh, atomic testing and nuclear testing. Um, so I'm going to take you on a little tour of where I live. I live in Nevada, where I run a center for art and environment. I'm going to take you of the, a tour, uh, on a tour of the nuclear sites that I've been to and try to tie this together a little bit with what well, Helen was saying as well. <coughs> Excuse me. This is a Wendover, Utah. Uh, it's a little town that's uh, split between the two states. It's on Interstate 80, one of our busiest freeways that runs through America. This is a photograph by Mark Collette. He's standing on a hill um, above uh, the town of Wendover. And in the distance there, uh, sort of going towards the horizon, you'll see some buildings. That is what remains of Wendover Air Base. It was the largest military base uh, in World War II, anywhere in the world. And there's a building sort of in the center of the picture below that funny little bomb-shaped thing, which is actually a Christmas light, uh, hanging on some wires above town. They light this up at night during Christmas. Right below that little bomb shape is the uh, hangar in which the Enola Gay was housed before it flew into the Pacific to uh, Tenement, uh, Tien, Tinian, uh, and then on to Hiroshima. This is the photographic series, <coughs> pardon me, that Mark Klett <coughs> made inside the hangar when we were allowed in there in the early 2000s. Mark and I worked on a book called The Half-Life of History. It's a history of what happened at Wendover and then what happened at Hiroshima. Uh, you're not allowed inside the hangar anymore, but this is where the Enola Gay sat and was prepped for that mission. Really, really spooky, beautiful space, but very spooky. And again, like I say, you're not allowed in there anymore. The hangar's falling apart. Should be a national monument to tragedy, and it's not. The Enola Gay, by the way, which is owned by the Smithsonian, um, has never really been pulled out for full display in the context of what its mission was. 
It's always been displayed as kind of this icon of American uh, military technological triumph uh, versus its place in history. Very interesting. This is a photograph, a very poor photograph, that's very typical of the Center for Land Use Interpretation in Los Angeles. Um, they don't believe in being beautiful, beautiful photographers. Uh, they believe in simply documenting what is. And this is a road in Nevada, about two hours east of Reno, where I live. It's a dirt, simple dirt road. It's a public road, and everyone's free to drive on it. And it takes you to a very interesting place. It takes you to where, um, in 1963, a 12-kiloton bomb was detonated underground. Everybody thinks that all of the atomic testing that was done in, in Nevada was done at the Nevada test site, which is an area about the size of our New England. It's a very large place. That's uh, 1,350 square miles. That's not true. There were tests that were done in other places around Nevada. This is where the actual test took place. And that pipe that you see in the center of the photograph is what's left of the place where they, they dropped the, uh, um, the device down into the ground 1,200 feet. Uh, and then they had cables going down that recorded what happened when the bomb blew up underground and made itself a, a glass bubble around the uh, site of the explosion. I've sat on this site and had lunch with my son. <clears throat> it's not really particularly radioactive unless you start digging around in the dirt. And then, of course, we know what happens. You don't want to dig around in the dirt there. So that's a site that you can actually go to. And it's a very interesting thing. You go there. It's public land, as I said. It's not forbidden to go there at all. And that's when the helicopter shows up with the cameraman inside who circles around you and photographs you. <laughs> this is a site um, about, oh, four hours south on a, on a small two-lane highway. <clears throat> Again, it's right next to the road you drive by. Most people drive by and they don't know what this is. This is the much larger pipeline that went 1,200 feet down to a one megaton test that was done in 1968. The government was looking for places where they could explode, they explode bombs besides the Nevada test site to see if there were more stable geological structures that would not create these big subsistence craters, of which I'll show you a picture in a moment. Um, and this didn't work. It uh, fractured the earth and caused earthquakes and did all sorts of things, and so they decided not to blow up any more bombs there. So it's remarkable that you can actually drive to two sites in Nevada that are just kind of publicly available, and you can sit at a ground zero if you want to. I don't know of any other place in the world where you can do that. This is Yucca Flat. This is the primary site of most of the tests, uh, or the densest, the densest uh, uh, occasion uh, for nuclear tests uh, during, done during the Cold War. <clears throat> These are all subsidence craters. These are not holes in the ground made by a bomb being exploded directly above it. These are craters made by um, what happened actually under the ground. It's a photograph by Emmett Gowan, uh, who has an extraordinary career as an aerial photographer. Um, and he photographed actually the blowing up of Mount St. Helens. He, he, went, he was really curious to go photograph the aftermath of that volcanic eruption because it was felt it was the nearest thing he, he could find to a nuclear explosion. You're not really allowed to go on the test site uh, overhead and film it. You have to get special permission. It took Emmett Gowan years to get permission to make these photo, this photograph and the, the series uh, that he turned into a book. So I've actually traveled into the test site. Um, with Matt Coolidge, the director of the Center for Land Use Interpretation. And Matt was allowed <clears throat> to actually, by the Department of Energy, to actually make a guidebook to the Nevada test site. So you can find it on Amazon. And it's a very, he's allowed to do it because it's a non-political document. It's very neutral. It just says, here's what, where this happened, here's where this happened, here's where this happened. And he states no moral position whatsoever. He just simply describes it. He knows that if you look at that book, you'll make your own moral judgment. This is Yucca Mountain, which is also on the Nevada test site. You see a drilling unit up on the top there used to test the permeability of this uh, volcanic um, um, geological formation. This site was one of a number of sites being uh, looked at by the United States government as a possible place to put nuclear waste, uh, high-level nuclear waste, the plutonium that Helen was talking about. <clears throat> and it was a site that wasn't particularly high on any engineer's um, list. Uh, there are other formations in the, uh, on the planet and in the United States that are much more stable, that would be much safer places to put nuclear waste, things like salt domes. But they tend to be located in places like Louisiana, where um, there used to be a much more political, powerful senator than there was from Nevada. So Yucca Mountain got chosen by the government. All of the other sites, the studying was stopped. And uh, they decided that they would um, start to drill into Yucca Mountain. So they did. This is the entrance to uh, one of the two tunnels. It's a U-shaped tunnel. 
And uh, you see here the, the back end of the drilling unit. This is the servicing unit that uh, basically kept the, uh, the head of the drill that went in and made this enormous tunnel. And I'll just tell you one thing about touring through this facility, which I did um, when this photograph was made. And um, I was accompanied by three engineers and a PR person, and just myself there as a journalist. And uh, we, get, we get deep into the tunnel, and there's water running down everywhere. And um, I asked them about that. I said, you know, let's, nuclear waste gets really hot, and you're going to have water dripping on these canisters that are going to be really hot for tens of thousands of years. And uh, how do you feel about that? And they said, oh, well, yeah, we, you know, we're actually we're surprised about the water. We, um, we thought there was not going to be a problem with water. And I said, until you put that tanker truck up on top where you had that drilling rig, right? And I said, oh, yeah, you read about that, huh? And I said, yeah, I did. They took 70,000 gallons of water up on top of that geological formation. They emptied it out of that truck. And they thought it would take months, maybe years, for that water to percolate down through the mountain. Well, it took about two weeks. And uh, the water was just streaming down into the tunnel that they have dug. So they really, um, <clears throat> they were very concerned about that. So they've designed a heat shield. So they're going to put the canisters all next to each other, getting very hot under a heat shield. The water will drip onto the shield and roll off and then go into the ground. And they figure that that solution will last for a while. So the engineers have finally admitted. Oh, and the engineers also told me, by the way, yes, we've modeled a climate for the next 10,000 years, and we know exactly what it's going to do. And we know that water pouring through this mountain is not going to be a problem. That was before uh, we thought about climate change and global warming and a few things like that. So um, what they've done is now they've finally admitted there's nothing they can do to stop this entire system from breaking down. Plutonium is incredibly fugitive. There's nothing you can, you can do to stop it from moving around. It's so hot. Between the heat and the water, any containment structures that they devise are simply going to be gone before 10,000 years, way, way before the half-life of the plutonium. The stuff's going to be in the water table. Um, I would worry about the future of Las Vegas if I thought Las Vegas were still going to be there 10,000 years from now. So in any case, this is a site, again, you're not allowed to visit. It is currently closed because our senator, Harry Reid, has the, the head of the US Senate. He's a, the, uh, the most senior politician there. And, um, and with the most power, and uh, he's unfortunately not running for re-election. Uh, he's, he's kind of run out his political currency, and uh, we could see it reopened when somebody else from the other party takes over, so it'll be very interesting to see what happens. Now, Yucca Mountain's of interest to art because of this. <clears throat> this is the world's largest single sculpture. It's a sculpture by a man named Michael Heiser, a well-known land art artist, and it's called City. It's a mile and a third long, it's a quarter of a mile wide, it's 20 feet below grade and 20 feet above grade, and it is a, a sculpture that is a dialogue between um, Mesoamerican forms and Eastern, um, sorry, Western European geometric forms. So he has all of these kind of rectilinear geometries worked out on either end and in the middle are these, are these kind of organic forms. This is how big this is, and you see the size of that cement truck and you realize uh, how big these forms are that he's making at one end. This is a, a slide uh, that was in the New York Times, an image that was in the New York Times about you know, 10 years ago. Uh, and the work's about finished now. And one thing that Michael Heiser is very concerned about with this enormous sculpture, and by the way, when, you, when you're on his property and you're looking at this, you can't even see there's an enormous sculpture there. The berms are about 20 feet high. They're covered in, and planted in native grasses, and it subsides into the landscape very nicely. But when you're in the middle of it, you see all these big forms. So Michael Heiser um, really doesn't want to look at a train going next to his sculpture that's carrying nuclear waste to Yucca Mountain, which is exactly where the route of the train is planned to go. <clears throat> this is standing up above on one of those berms, looking south across Michael's uh, sculpture. That dome is one of the big Mesoamerican forms. And in between that dome and the mountain range in the background is where the train track will go that would carry the waste that would go to Yucca Mountain. So Senator Reid has uh, introduced a bill to turn this entire valley into a national monument and protect it uh, and to keep, uh, among other things, the waste train going away, going across it to Yucca Mountain. So he's trying very hard to, um, to not create this uh, nuclear dump uh, in Nevada, and he's using an artwork as part of his argument against it. So I, um, one of the things we've been talking about this week is, does art actually do anything in the world? 
Is it other, something other than something beautiful or provocative to look at or experience? <clears throat> and I guess I would say that here's a clear example of art having a political role in a very, very interesting and dangerous conversation about energy and energy blowback that relates actually to climate change. And I think I'll end right there. Okay. Um, now, Associate Professor Peter Christoph. Thanks very much. Um, look, first of all, I want to also echo Bill's comments and uh, express my thanks to Guy and also to Bronwyn Johnson for having masterminded this conference. This conference is quite extraordinary, and the discussion that it's beginning to generate, I think, is exceptionally important, particularly in Australia, where I think we've got an ossified culture when it comes to dealing with climate change. Um, I've been given the unenviable task, I think, of talking about politics and climate change in this context, or trying to make some sort of tenuous link between the art of politics and the politics of art. Um, you might wonder why I've got this slide up, and this is going to be a case of um, more power and less point. I've only got two slides. But I really wanted to make the point that in terms of politics, in terms of speaking and, and politics, speaking, representation and power are the staples of politics. Who speaks for whom, who speaks when, how and with what effect are critical. And I want to talk about this in relation to climate change, which is what I teach about at Melbourne University. Um, in one sense, I think paradoxically, there's no lack of voices speaking for the earth. All you have to do is listen. There's a cacophony of voices. Not so many in the city, but if you go out into a place like East Gippsland, or if you don't get that far, if you actually listen to what scientists and indigenous peoples and others are saying, saying about the nature around us, there is a lot that is going on that we could listen to. Other species, the planet itself, will tell us a great deal, and if it won't tell us nicely, then we've seen the storms, we've seen the disruptions, which are also another way of the planet speaking back to us. The problem, I think, is that we're hard of hearing. The scientists, the signs that have been read by the scientists, by indigenous Australians and others, actually very rarely come through to politics, to politicians, to political institutions. Particularly in Australia, politicians and political institutions are largely deaf, deaf to Earth's messages and warnings. So what this talk is about, really, is about listening and about translation, about translating these messages into a political language and into ins institutions and actions which can actually respond to them and overcoming the blockages that we currently have with the institutions and the actors and the interests that can't or don't want to listen. Um, as a species, we're very smart. We're an incredibly inventive species, technologically, culturally, politically. And the story of energy is really, I think, a brilliant example of our inventiveness. It's only about 300 years since energy was really confined, powerfully confined in space and time. We pretty much operated according to the power of sun, the sun, confined to one generation, in many cases confined to one day. A man and his plough, a weaver and her candle, the use, of the use of fire to light a home or to cook a meal, the use of wind power, manpower, now labour power, horse power, candle power. If you wanted to do much more, up until about 300 years ago, you had to get your slaves into some sort of line. But the Industrial Revolution utterly transformed that, and we're the beneficiaries of that, and I think it's something worth acknowledging. It enabled us to reach into the deep past to get access to a huge amount of fossilised sunlight, millions of years of trapped sunlight, and then convert it into something that would reach into the deep future. It's a very powerful acceleration of the capacity for development, very uneven too, across the planet. Even 100 years ago, many would say coal was good for humanity, which I think tells us about how out of date certain people might be in politics in Australia. It created also this, this politics of energy, this capacity, this economy of new energy, fossil fuels, the age of coal, then the age of oil, then the age of gas, created needs and connections well beyond the boundaries of empires and nation states. Industrialization, economic power, built huge capacity in certain countries, the United Kingdom, the United States, now China. It enabled and drove and it enables and drives global chains of production and consumption global trade, global economic activity, and it's created massive new relations of power, energy empires, and where energy is insufficient within a country, then energy trade and even energy wars, a global energy economy based on oil, coal, gas, nuclear power. Australia still believes that it can become an energy superpower, have a look at the white papers, based on our exports of coal and gas. 
Even 50 years ago, most of us had no idea of the consequences of this sort of transformation. We now talk about the Anthropocene, we talk about climate change, about ocean acidification, about biodiversity loss. All of these are things which have stretched time. The use of fossil fuels in particular has stretched time, as I mentioned, into the deep past, but also into the deep future. It has also created a borderless or bound, unbounded world. We have risks and consequences that stretch across space, affecting distant humans, other species, and across time in terms of un unborn generations of humans and others, which is very much Helen's point. So over a really brief period of time in a geological sense, we've now forced ourselves into a situation where we have to accommodate a wholly new understanding of the Earth, especially politically. Now we're in a really inventive species culturally and politically. Many political scientists like me would like to say, would hope that we are living in the age of democracy. You know, Churchill's comment, it's the worst political system bar all of the others. But the problem with democracy as we know it is that it is narrowly, narrowly bounded in terms of our scopes and interests. It's very much focused on the here and now. Uh, political elections, an election currently on in the United Kingdom, abounded three-year time cycles, four-year time cycles. They're very much confined by the borders of the nation states. We are citizens of states. When it comes to speaking of interests, and democracy encourages people to speak of their very narrow interests, if anyone's going to speak about the earth in terms of their interests, Gene Reinhardt will speak about iron ore, Tony Abbott will speak about coal. This sort of narrow, binding, siloed response is precisely exactly what we cannot use if we're going to deal with the problems we currently, can, currently deal with. Democracy is very poor at the moment in registering the important consequences across space and time of the things that we're doing, and it's profoundly insensitive to risk. One really good example of this in Australia has been the intergenerational report. Almost nothing of consequence, less than a page, and nothing of any real consequence in terms of its commentary on environmental or, in, or climate change related problems, loss and damage into the future, which are huge issues for the Australian economy if we end up getting away from coal, exactly where are our ex what are our exports going to be, or if indeed, as I sort of uh, encourage you to read the book on four degrees, if we continue down the trajectory that we're heading down at the moment, if we hit climate change in its full awfulness, the consequences for Australia in terms of agriculture, tourism, the mining industry, and our cities and our lives generally will be profound on the state. None of that in the, in, in the intergenerational report. We also have a political system which is profoundly insensitive to risk. The best we are aiming for in international negotiations at the moment is two degrees centigrade, or 450 parts per million. 450 parts per million of greenhouse gases gives us a one in two chance of staying under two degrees of warming, and two degrees of warming is catastrophic for most places, certainly low-lying island states. How many of you take out insurance policies on a one in two chance? This is not the sort of world we actually expect to live in or we want our politicians to respond to. Okay, so what would the difference look like? What would an ecological democracy look like? Well, political systems are meant to be inclusive, so what we would ideally want is a political system that speaks for the Earth, it would have a full set of representatives, a council of all species, probably a, number game, a numbers game already ruled, ruled, that would be ruled by termites and ants and cockroaches. They've got the numbers. But some of you may be tempted to say the cockroaches are already in power. It'd be unkind. And we'd want to have an ecological international system, a system in which sovereign nation states don't merely defend their territories and their capacities, which serves us very poorly in an ecological sense. Now, as we all know, we've already had some very powerful examples of failure in terms of the long, drawn-out negotiations at the, in the international domain, in terms of getting targets and effort coordinated to save this planet. I haven't quite lost hope in the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Copenhagen was a disaster. Paris later this year may be better, but I don't think it's going to come home with the goods. The World Trade Organization well and truly outweighs the impacts of the Framework Convention on Climate Change. We are overwhelmed by particular and localised interests. OK, so how do we get out of this trap and quickly? Well, there's no silver bullet, I'm sorry. We could think about democ democracy with proxies, in other words, expanding the circle of representation. In other words, other ways of bringing other species and distant others and future generations into the democratic calculus. I kid you not, it would be very interesting to have a parliament in which you dedicated a couple of seats to representatives of other species and, distance, and distant others. In a hung parliament, 
it would be a very powerful position if someone was a commissioner for the environment and took up that particular role. Clearly, that's a, probably a call way too far for most. But we do have green parties, and the Greens have been a very powerful insertion of a particularly broad conception of the planet into a very narrow set of politics. Of course, not everyone's, not everyone's taste. There is also, therefore, the issue of inserting green politics into the behaviour of other parties, sensitising them to the ways in which they need to think about risk and extent. There's also a puzzle in the Australian case in particular about how we in incorporate scientific advice into our decision making. I've been fairly broad brush in terms of talking about democracy and its failings, but some countries clearly are operating vastly better than we do here. The British, I think, pay huge respect to science because they think they invented it. They probably did. The Germans believe that science is critically important because they think they've perfected it. The Americans believe that science is important because they've spent so much money on it that they pay a little less attention to it than they probably ought. In Australia, we struggle to spell science in Parliament. We got rid of the Minister and the Department of Science altogether. And the previous um, chief scientist never actually saw the Prime Minister. We actually need a culture of political advice, which is a little more robust than the one we have at the moment. OK, I'm not putting too much faith in formal politics and inter in international negotiations. I actually would put greater faith in another version of politics, which I think we're all here at least a little familiar with, if not with the term. I believe very strongly what we need is a version of ecological citizenship, in other words, acting as though we do represent and speak for the earth, but in a whole range of different practice, not merely how we vote in our formal political practices. The environment movement is one example of this sort of ecological citizenship, but in terms of how we behave and what we do, we all can make our lives much more robust and extensive in the ways in which I'm suggesting. To end on, I suppose, a weak but optimistic note, I mean, I think we probably all recognise that we've overstepped the mark. Development, the Industrial Revolution, is an act of hubris at this stage, which is a, ca and can a case of massive overreach. Overreach is the hallmark of our time. Less is more. Listening is learning. Being a little silent. Stepping back, perhaps to use energy which is more confined. Solar power and renewable energy is a very good version of returning to modesty and also being prepared to share the benefits of our industrialisation, one at the great expense of many others around the planet. In a sense, what we need to do through our practices, and this is where I want to get back to the issue of art, is to sensitise the formal and the informal political domain. We need to expand the sensitivity of our responses and behaviour in an ecological sense to politics. In other words, the art of politics needs to be subverted by the politics of art or well, the art of power needs to be undermined by the power of art. In that sense, and I think that Dave, uh, David may speak to this, this term, he used it in his lecture a couple of nights ago, he talks about climate equals culture. And I think if you equate culture here with art, climate ought to equal culture and ought to equal politics. We need to use art and culture to reframe the way in which we do politics, in Australia especially, but elsewhere as well. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak um, in this wonderful festival. Who speaks for the earth? It's a good question, uh, but it's one that also troubles me in some respects. Um, as Peter has already indicated, speaking for always carries a risk of misrepresentation, perhaps even silencing. Perhaps what's more critical is to reposition ourselves as participants in a more than human conversation speaking in solidarity with other kind and amplifying their voices when appropriate. So I also want to begin instead with a prior question. Who is listening? Well, back in the 6th century BCE, the Hebrew prophet Jeremiah was listening, and what he heard he described as the earth mourning using a Hebrew word that also means drying out. And in the mournful drying out of the land, and in the disappearance of birds and animals, he discerned the baleful impact of a society bent on the pursuit of power and profit to the, ex to the neglect of good stewardship of the land, as well as at the expense of the poor and marginalized. 
Well, I can't claim to know much about Jeremiah's society back in 6th century BCE, but his diagnosis certainly rings true to our own time and place, it seems to me, where powerful political and financial interests conspire to keep most of us ignorant or worse, indifferent towards the true cost of our fossil fueled lifestyle on the vulnerable, human and otherwise. Here on this continent, though, there are people who retain well-honed cultural practices of listening to the earth, or as they generally prefer, listening to country. Linguist and oral historian Anna Dwyer, a Kadajadi woman from the Kimberley, is one such. And when she speaks about her people's concern regarding the changes that they're already seeing on their land, including the increasing frequency of extreme weather, she says that the most common response is a sense that country needs healing. Country needs healing. How different is this from the responses we see in the mainstream media to such extremes? Categorized as natural disasters, they're framed in terms of a wild and amoral force, something over yonder, a hostile other, against which we humans are implicitly encouraged to band together to defend ourselves. In the midst of the fires and floods of the angry summer of 2012-2013, as it was dubbed by the Climate Council, Prime Minister Julia Gillard, carefully avoiding any controversial references to anthropogenic climate change, instead invoked the Aussie battler trope. The whole country, she said, was being challenged by nature, but we're a strong and smart nation, and we'll get through this, as we always do. Well, in light of her subsequent woes, I don't want to pick on Jules, but this comment exemplifies what I believe is a profoundly maladaptive way of framing those calamities that have come to be known in modernity as natural disasters. In fact, as I argue in my new book, and I do in fact have a copy here, Dancing with Disaster, this very concept, the concept of natural disaster, is deafening us to the voice of Earth and impeding our capacity to understand ourselves as part of a multi-species collective increasingly imperiled by human actions and inactions. Well, across all cultures throughout the world for most of human history, natural disasters, as, as they became known in English only during the latter part of the 19th century, were, of course, interpreted very differently, namely as a response to human wrongdoing on the part of God or the gods or an indwelling power inherent in the sacred order of things. In this hermeneutic horizon, in this horizon of interpretation, morality and materiality, social relations and natural phenomena were understood to be interconnected. How people comported themselves with one another and with other others had environmental consequences, and environmental disturbances, especially big ones, had moral, religious, and political reverberations. This mythic way of making sense of calamities induced by phenomena such as earthquakes, floods, droughts, wildfires, hur hurricanes, and pandemic disease, long looked upon askance by some European philosophers and theologians began to wane in earnest with the rise of a mechanistic and atomistic view of matter during the 17th and 18th centuries, at least among the European intelligentsia and political elites. In the wider society, the shift was slow and uneven, with Christian versions of the par punishment paradigm persisting well into the 19th century and among biblical literalists, regrettably, even beyond. Eventually, though, the modern understanding took hold according to which the merely material realm of nature followed its own mechanistic principles that were entirely separate from human morality and social relations. Such calamities were now seen to have purely physical causes. This interpretive schema has proven highly beneficial in certain respects. By letting those deemed deviant off the hook, it's fostered an ethos of humanitarian assistance to people afflicted by disasters, in preference to blaming the victims by speculating as to what they must have done to earn such divine disfavor. 
By promoting the systematic scientific investigation of the physical causes of such phenomena on this volatile planet of ours, the naturalization of disaster has also enabled the development of practical measures, such as early warning systems and improved building codes that can help to ameliorate their impacts, if not in most cases their occurrence. These undoubted advances have nonetheless come at a cost, one that is evident in the fact that by the end of the very century in which the premise of natural disaster became commonplace, the toll that such calamities um, was taking on both human and non-human lives and abodes had actually begun to escalate. So while the concept of natural disaster demythologized earlier understandings, it became in turn a cornerstone of the mythos of modernity. It's a product of what French philosopher Michel Serre has termed the modern constitution, which became embedded in the institutions of knowledge production during the 19th century, severing the natural from the human sciences, as if humans were not part of nature. This epistemological divide arises from a longer standing set of interlocking metaphysical dualisms, culture and nature, man and beast, mind and body, spirit and matter. Under the modern constitution, cultural historical differences also got mapped onto this dualistic schema to become modern implied transcending nature by means of the internalization of civilized constraints along with the ever more expansive techno-scientific domination of the material realm. Primitive peoples, it was thought, lived in or close to nature, while modern peoples, whether for better or for worse, were deemed to have left nature behind. As Bruno Latour has demonstrated, though, this is another of those modern myths. All people live in natural cultural collectives, which is to say, in socially structured networks of interrelationship among diverse human and non-human agencies and processes. The exact configuration of those collectives can nonetheless vary widely with significant implications for the relative sustainability of the societies in question and with industrial modernity proving peculiarly unsustainable. And this is no coincidence. For the dualistic onto epistemology of the modern con constitution took shape and struck root at precisely the time when science and technology were enrolling ever more non-human entities into the complex networks that are constitutive of industrial and for that matter so-called post-industrial societies. And along with the things that most of us value, like refrigerators and motor cars, this process has unintentionally generated various seriously undesirable natural cultural hybrids, such as ozone depletion and global warming. Meanwhile, coming to terms with these hybrid phenomena, which can only be understood and redressed through a transdisciplinary lens, has been rendered all the more difficult because of the great divide between the sciences and the humanities, along with the marginalization of alternative knowledge systems, notably those of colonized peoples. Similarly, the crucial task of recognizing and addressing the multiple human and non-human agencies and processes that go into the making of an eco-catastrophe such as a Fukushima disaster has been severely hindered by the modern myth of natural disaster. Arising from the nexus where environment, society and technology come together to create vulnerabilities that are unevenly distributed among people and between species, such calamities are actually processes rather than events and they're never purely natural, but inherently socio-ecological. So what I set out to do in this book was to explore how historical research in conjunction with narrative fiction might contribute to a practice of learning more skillfully to dance, as I put it, with the increasingly unruly elements of our disastrously anthropogenic environment. With respect to climate change, that means, of course, mitigating both the causes and impacts of global warming, but also developing clever, creative, and compassionate ways of living with uncertainty and adversity, of recovering from calamity, and of recognizing when the message brought by such sentinel events, the earth speaking back, is calling for transformation rather than just regrouping and rebuilding. 
And in particular, I explore the potential of narrative fiction to open an ethical space of reflection regarding eco-catastrophe, a space within which non-human as well as human interests and interactions, lives and deaths are seen to be salient. One of the novels I don't discuss there, but particularly like as a work of cli-fi, climate change fiction, which is a burgeoning field, is Flight Behaviour by Barbara Kingsolver, um, in which the protagonist learns to listen to the Earth with the help of the natural scientist who teaches her to read in the arrestingly beautiful arrival of Mexican monarch butterflies in the forested hills of Tennessee, a dire symptom of anthropogenic, anthropogenic climate change. This is a reminder that while those with traditional ecological knowledge and values might be best placed to recognize that country needs healing, discerning the non-local causes and potential cures of its ailments demands a global scientific effort. But Kingsolver's scientist, delightfully enough, for a literary scholar, is called Ovid Byron. <laughs> A reminder also that we need writers and artists to amplify today's prophetic voices and to help us to understand why their witness matters and how we might respond. Thank you. Climate is culture. I set up, well actually I'm an artist, and about 15 years ago, out of artistic inquiry, I got very involved with climate scientists, oceanographers, mathematical modelers. What intrigued me was that these mathematical modelers, it wasn't a precise science, but they actually, through the kind of huge computer kind of power to actually crunch numbers and some really sexy algorithms, could actually work to predict the future. And I don't think society's ever, ever, ever had a tool that actually could predict the future with any kind of robust intellectualism. So this intrigued me as an artist. You know, artists have always dreamed of the future. But here was something that the scientists were doing would say, okay, 10, 15, 20 years time, this is what's gonna happen, especially in terms of climate. So I started working with them, and you know, 15 years ago, climate change really wasn't on many people's radar. And they were very frustrated and going, why is nobody listening to us? And in a way, their language is, you know, it's a language of data and graphs and information and hard facts. And it's not a language that's in our popular domain. So I thought, well, OK, if we worked with the climate scientists and the oceanographers, and we went to what is the front line of climate change, in this case, the high Arctic, and we did it in a sailboat, and we put in creative people there, you know, the writers, the artists, the thinkers, the filmmakers, the poets, and we would engage, if we could get the two camps to work together, share their common knowledge, and actually find a different language, in order to bring this very, very important subject to the public domain. So we've sailed now eight times into the Arctic. Um, we, this experiment truly worked. Um, we have inspired over 360 artists to engage with this program. Um, we've written books, Ian McEwan Solar, for example, was all inspired by one of our trips. Um, we've made films at the BBC, we've made films at Sundance, we've written poetry, we've done operas, we've done theatre. It's been an extraordinary outpouring of, of activity, trying to take the really complex kind of notions that the science have bring, these very abstract, you know, they sort of say temperature rise of two degrees, three degrees, these are very kind of difficult things for the general public to get hold of. But what the artists do is to sort of say, well, I'll take all that information on board, but I'll actually craft it into a narrative, a story. I'll bring home a story on a human scale. And I think this is what has happened. After that point, you, about seven or eight years ago, um, there was a big shift in culture, especially in Northern Europe, or in Europe, per se, where climate change was very, very much an accepted reality. So we've got the accepted reality, and then you suddenly realize, well, actually, the scientists are not causing climate change. The cause of climate change is the way we've evolved our very complex societies. Over the last 200 years, brilliant societies, you know, of what is medical innovation and technical innovation, wonderful science at the same time, brilliant art. So it's an incredibly strong society, global society that we built.
But at the same time, we are causing climate change, and we have to address that in a very, very serious manner. So I think the next part of our work with Cape Farewell was to address the actual notion that culture is actually causing climate change. And by culture, I don't just mean the arts. I mean, you know, the economic structures that are embedded in our culture, the social systems, that was what I meant by culture. So I'm going to show a little bit of film of a guy called Tom Rand, who has a doctorate in philosophy, but he is also an entrepreneur. And he's a clean tech entrepreneur. And he's working out of Canada. So this is a tiny little bit of film. What we're going to build is the energy internet, the smart grid. So it's solar from some parts of the continent, wind from others, wind onshore, wind offshore, biomass, geothermal, energy storage, tidal. And you put all those together, and what you have is an energy dance. And you match that dance with demand. That's called the smart grid. We have an amazing opportunity to be the ones that when future generations look back, they did it. They did it. They turned, they turned their, their world upside down and they changed what had happened for 100 plus years. So in a way, there you've got Tom, who kind of brings this new technology into the world. And again, so the, art, the ask from the artists, the creators, is to actually embrace this new technology and actually bring it into the public domain. In the same way that I asked the, you know, the creatives to actually engage with the scientists, can they now engage with the clean tech industries and bring that into the meaning of it into the public domain? So Marcus Brigstock, um, comedian who traveled with us twice on the expeditions and embraced the whole subject and the notion of climate change, then sort of put out the challenge, wouldn't it be great if in 20 or 30 years' time they could look back and say, wow, our society completely reformed itself, embraced the new, carried on having the, the lives, the rich lives we had, but without damaging the planet. And I think that's what Marcus's challenge is, and that's where we're going forward. So I want to bring you just one example of what we're working with now. Well, I would not in a minute. I'm going to go first first. This is slightly back to Tom's argument, you know, where is the energy from? This little world map from Europe, um, you're looking at the Sahara Desert. That red square that is the world written on it, if you manage to harness all of the solar energy that we could trap, if you manage to harness all the solar energy that falls within that red square, then actually that would supply the whole world with the energy demands that it needs. You know, the amount of energy that is falling on this planet from the sun. You know, you could transport that to Australia. It's just, you know, a certain part of Australia, same big area. You could supply the whole of the world's energy just from solar. You know, Australia could become a superpower for energy, but in a very, very different way than where it's imagined at the moment. So let's take another technology that is being proposed right now. On the south coast of England, there's a town called Swansea. Swansea has a tidal range of 16 meters to 18 meters, depending on the moon cycles. So the plan is to build this huge tidal wall that would actually be a lagoon. The tide would come in and come out and produce the energy we need. If we build six of these tidal lagoons around the country, that's 10% of the energy needs. So you kind of go, well, OK. You know, technology can come in and actually replace the energy supply. But again, the story is, when they started to propose the thinking of building this, they think, well, wait a minute, you're going to build this huge structure right on the seafront of Swansea. You've got to actually work with the Swansea and the town of Swansea and the South Wales communities to actually get them to embrace this. So they came, we became the cultural partners. So this is the creatives acting in parallel with a company, I mean, a business that actually wants to build a tidal lagoon. So, you know, this extraordinary structure that was going to be, is going to be proposed, the moment it's gone through planning, we've been working for four years with the communities, with the education, with the council, and actually there's no pushback. Everybody's going, wow, this is something I really, really want to have on my doorstep. It's clean energy, it's loads of jobs, it's new technology, blah, blah, what's not to like. Just to give you an imagination of how much power, this, small, this is a smallish lagoon, but just to give you an imagination, if you can imagine the volume of this room that we're in, this big hall, that amount of water will pass through the turbines in one third of a second. That is a lot, a lot of energy. The tide comes in, the tide goes out, it does that ad infinitum. 
The time scale build for this power station is 120 years. That's what they're mapping the economy on. And you know that in 50 years' time, on a particular Tuesday, in a particular day in April, in a particular time, I can tell you exactly the amount of energy you will get from this power station. And it's, you know, it's just endless. So it's the kind of thing that Tom is talking about. So when we kind of got this far and we were working, then the, the, the owners of the lagoon said, well, wouldn't it be great if we commissioned a piece of art that actually would sit there that would embrace the whole story of the tidal lagoon? So what we did was to send out a worldwide competition and actually say, can you give me a piece of art that actually somehow would embrace the whole notions of the tidal lagoon? And this is what's happened. This is a piece by Peter Wall. This is the proposal. And it's very, very clever kind of, it, you know, it just tells you exactly what's happening. As the moon goes around the Earth, we all know, the tide comes in, the tide goes out. But actually, you also see that little pointer at the bottom. As the tide is in a particular place, then that is where it's generating maximum energy. And then as it comes down, it then reduces the amount of energy. You know, it's such a beautiful, beautiful, exquisitely beautiful piece of sculpture. At the same time, it's also carrying the message of what's going on. And in a way, it's dealing with the issue of what we're dealing, you know, we're wanting, but, you know, great piece of art. Another piece of, uh, this is by Mary Ellen Neudecker. She proposed a moon, I mean, not a big, I mean, a huge moon. A moon is, you know, it's a big moon. This is going to sit right in the middle of the lagoon. Um, what is kind of fascinating about it, she wants it lit at night. But in order to make that work, what she's going to do is that the dark side of the moon, which happens to face south, is all going to be solar panels. So the side side of the moon that you don't see will be solar panels. That will generate the energy that will provide. So it's a completely neutral balance of energy. It is, you know, it is a fabulous piece. It indicates where the energy is coming from. It'll be a social, you know, a viewing platform. Everybody will want to be there, you know, and it'll be a place of actually, you know, place to go and play. It's a park, in a sense. Um, another proposal that came through, I mean, we had over 100 proposals, so I'm only giving you the, the winners. We are now going to create this incredible sculpture park in the whole, around this lagoon. It'll be the only power station in the world. It'll be the first power station that's a tidal lagoon, but it'll also be a first power station that's a social resource. People will want to go and visit this power station because it's so much fun because you've got all this art and it's a beautiful thing. That's the ambition for it. Um, this lovely piece, you know, you take a traditional piece of sea furniture, a foghorn, a seahorn, but instead of actually putting those noises out, you're actually going to create a piece of music that is based on the solar cycles, and at the same time, it also uses world words from the, the Welsh culture. So, the, you know, Welsh has its own language, so actually using Welsh language in order to, to, to kind of give the social significance of where this place is built. Another piece, and finally, I mean, this is Tomo. This is, there's a lovely video of this, but I won't show you the video. But if you actually take the top left-hand picture, there is a boat, and it's just sitting there at high tide. The containers are actually fixed to the bottom of the water. So as the tide goes down, the containers become visible, right? So low tide, the boat's way down there, the containers are like piled up high, and at some point, they just release all the water. Now, Thomas' idea is, A, we're relying, this whole thing relies on gravity, lunar gravity, lunar energy, tidal energy to actually make it work as a piece of art. But he's also questioning our notion of shipping, you know, world trade. Can we still have world trade and have energy that's generated by nature? Can we have a conversation with nature, work in parallel, in partnership with nature, and not abuse it, and just abuse it? And I think this is the piece of sculpture that will just go in and out, the boat will come up and down, but it's a lovely kind of reflection of what the artist is trying to do. Somebody sent me this slide the other day, and I just think it's wonderful, um, you know, can you actually, oh yeah, you can see that little dot, right? That's us. <laughs> can you explain to me? You know, there, you know, this is solar, we've looked at tidal. If you go geothermal, you go, you know, any of the other wind, all of these resources will not end. They will carry on for millions, you know, thousands, thousands of years. All we've got now is the technology to harness this energy. And as Tom says, you need the internet, you need the smart grid. 
This smart grid, DC electricity, not AC, because it doesn't lose power. You have that in place. You know, when the wind's not blowing, the sun's shining somewhere. You know, it just connects us all up. So we can deliver worldwide, globally, the energy we need just from the normal natural systems that, go, that exist. And that's the ambition. And climate, yes, it is about the way we live. We've got to embrace it. We've got to get excited by it. And it's, yeah, it's positive. It, you know, it, it's not gloom and doom. This is what is just on the horizon for us to achieve. And there is plenty of money in the way. You know, just take the money out of fossil fuel exploration and put it into new clean tech jobs, new clean tech energy, and embrace the future. And there we go. Thank you very much. <laughs> Once again, I'd like to thank um, Guy and his team from Climart, to Suzanne and her team from the RMIT Gallery, and um, to Melbourne Conversations. I want to thank all of you for coming out on a cold Melbourne evening. And in particular, I want to thank uh, our panel, e each of whom uh, on the panel spoke so well. Please join me in thanking them. <laughs>